World War II, the United States had the largest tail to teeth ratio of any belligerent nation. In other words, there were more people backing up each American frontline combatant than there were behind each Britain, German, Soviet, soldier, sailor, or airman. In part, at least, this was because American GIs expected, as a matter of course, to be on the receiving end of things like Hershey bars, Coca-Cola, newspapers, mail from home, as well as food and ammunition. But in part two, it was because as the richest of all the belligerent nations on either side, the United States could supply these things. This is not to say that active service in World War II on any front was a walk in the park, but it does help explain why American forces were significantly more efficient than their foes at the pointy end of the spear. Because every one of those soldiers, sailors, and airmen, and Marines had as many as a dozen others who were keeping him there. And among those backing up the front line were the skilled workers at Navy Yards on both coasts as well as overseas, including advanced locations like Pearl Harbor. And certainly the job they did readying the aircraft carrier USS Yorktown for the Battle of Midway is an example of that. On May 27, 1942, the Yorktown limped into Pearl Harbor after a journey of nearly 4,000 miles from the Coral Sea. She was listing slightly, trailing a 10 mile long oil slick from damage she had received in the battle there only 19 days before. Even so, she arrived one day ahead of schedule and that one day mattered because Admiral Chester Nimitz already knew thanks to Joe Rochefort's team of codebreakers, that Japan was planning to attack Midway Atoll only eight days from then. The Japanese were coming, Rochefort told Nimitz, with at least four aircraft carriers, possibly five. He wasn't sure about that fifth one yet. It says a lot about Nimitz's willingness to make bold decisions that he had already decided to confront this juggernaut. For the record, Ernest King, whose default personality was to be as aggressive as possible, was not so sure. Evidence suggests he was shocked, and I mean literally shocked, by the loss of the Lexington and the Coral Sea. And in the aftermath of that, he had suggested to Nimitz that planes from both the Lexington and the Yorktown should be apportioned out to airfields in the South Pacific while the Yorktown went into the yard at Puget Sound, Washington for a full repair. At first, Nimitz too thought the Yorktown would have to go back to the West Coast for a complete refit, but even if that proved necessary, he planned to confront the approaching Japanese fleet with just Halsey's two carriers, which he had recalled from the South Pacific, though Obviously, it would help a lot if the Yorktown could somehow be patched up in time to join the fight. King deferred to Nimitz's judgment, though he expressed his regret, as he put it, that you prefer not to employ Yorktown and Lexington personnel ashore. This was the background when, on May 27th, the Yorktown limped into Pearl. Now, during the Coral Sea battle, a single 550 pound bomb had landed directly on the Yorktown's flight deck, about 15 feet from her island. It had blown a hole through the flight deck, penetrated four levels into the ship, and exploded, killing and wounding dozens. Three of the ship's six boilers had to be taken offline. If you've seen the recent film Midway, you'll recall the scene when Nimitz, portrayed by Woody Harrelson, surveyed the ship after it arrived back in Pearl Harbor. There's a giant hole in the flight deck, which says a lot about what they can do with GCI imagery these days, and which looked pretty dramatic on film, but in fact, there was no hole in the Yorktown's flight deck. By then, the Yorktown's crew had already repaired the hole before she ever got to Pearl Harbor. 
far more serious than that one direct bomb hit where the several near misses, bombs that had exploded close alongside the Yorktown, because they had opened seams in the ship's hull below the surface from which she was leaking fuel oil. The crew of the Yorktown could not get to these, which is why it trailed that 10 mile long oil slick as she made her way back to Pearl. To repair the hull, the Yorktown had to go into dry dock. Nimitz knew this even before the Yorktown arrived because he had flown a survey team out to the ship while it was still en route. That team conducted a survey while the ship was still steaming and reported the results back to Nimitz. That information helped confirm Nimitz in his decision not to send her to Bremerton, but instead to attempt a local repair and try to get her ready for the coming battle for Midway. He radioed her skipper to take her straight into dry dock number one, where he had special blocks set up to receive her. Now, it was strict Navy protocol for safety reasons that a carrier going into dry dock to have all of her aviation fuel removed first. But Nimitz was in a hurry and he issued a special order voiding the rule. So after the Yorktown entered the dry dock and the water was pumped out, she settled down onto the blocks and her damaged hull was exposed. The near misses in the Coral Sea had opened seams in the skin of the hull from frames 100 to 130, a pretty lengthy se section of the hull. Admiral Jake Fitch, who had been on board the Lexington in the Coral Sea, estimated it would take 90 days to repair the Yorktown. If that were the case, there was no way it could take part in the defense of Midway. To see for himself, Nimitz personally accompanied the inspection party. And this is what the movie ought to have shown. Not a hole in the flight deck, a hole that wasn't there, but Nimitz wearing big hip boots over his khaki slacks, climbing down into the dry dock with water sloshing around his knees, personally inspecting the hull. That probably looks less dramatic on screen. At the end of his inspection, Nimitz told the party that the Yorktown had to be seaworthy and battle ready in three days. There was an awkward moment of silence as the members of the inspection party looked at one another, but of course, there's only one possible response. Yes, sir. In fact, Nimitz was pretty confident it could be done. He radioed King in Washington that the damage was not as bad as he had feared and that the Yorktown would be ready for operations in 48 to 60 hours. To make that happen, Nimitz authorized shore liberty for the Yorktown's crew, partly as a reward for their long cruise, partly to get them out of the way of the yard workers who swarmed over the ship, 1,400 fabricators, ship fitters, welders, all got to work and they did so with a purpose and intensity that suggested every minute counted, which of course it did. The work went on around the clock. Though the city of Honolulu was blacked out, the dockyard at Pearl Harbor was lit up all night long by giant floodlights. The demand for electricity to run the acetylene torches was so great, it caused power outages in Honolulu. Pushed to make quick fixes rather than permanent repairs, the yard workers did not bother with blueprints. They cut plywood templates to match the holes in the hull, sent the templates ashore to be fabricated in steel, and then welded the patches into place. In addition to the physical repairs to the ship, the Yorktown was also crippled by the loss of so many of her planes in the Coral Sea. And to make up those losses, Nimitz transferred planes and air crews from the Saratoga, which was undergoing repairs back in Bremerton, and transferred them to the Yorktown. And this is why, even though the Yorktown's hull number was five, the fighter squadron, the bombing squadron, and the torpedo squadrons on board her during the Battle of Midway were VF-3, VB-3, and VT-33, of course, being the Saratoga's hull number. 
The bombing squadron still consisted mostly of planes from the Yorktown and still commanded by Wally Short, but was nevertheless redesignated as VB-3, which is how it went into battle on June 4th. In other words, just as the Yorktown herself was cobbled together by the yard workers, her air group was also what the British would call a lash-up. Even now, King betrayed a certain uneasiness about committing all three of American carriers to a defensive midway, or maybe I should say two and a half carriers, since it was still not certain until the very last moment that the Yorktown could be made battle-worthy in time. And if not, Halsey's two carriers would confront Japan's four carriers and if one or, God forbid, two of them should be lost, it would leave the Japanese in control of the Central Pacific for the indefinite future. But the yard workers, part of that essential logistical tale in the American arsenal of weaponry, did get it done. Halsey's two carriers, which now came under the command of Raymond Spruance due to Halsey's appalling skin disease, probably shingles, exited Pearl Harbor on the morning of May 28th, with the Yorktown still in dry dock. The next day, May 29th, dry dock number one was reflooded, the Yorktown was prodded gingerly out into the roadstead, and even then, yard workers remained on board making last minute repairs, the bright points of their acetylene torches visible from shore. As they worked, the ship's boilers were lit, supplies were brought on board. Nimitz went down to the dry dock personally to thank the yard workers who had made all this possible. It takes nothing at all away from the sailors and pilots who fought the Battle of Midway to say that that victory was ensured, one of the most remarkable victories in all history, and that it would have had a far different trajectory if the yard workers at Pearl Harbor had not been able to pull off this miracle. Good morning and welcome to the Naval Historical Foundation's second Saturday show for May, 2022. Titled, Getting Our Ships Back in the Game, the story of shipyard and ship repair excellence from World War II to today. Many thanks to Dr. Craig Simons for his insightful narrative on the USS Yorktown. Simply put, our shipyards and ship repair facilities to this day are force multipliers. Our expert panel today will extol the virtues of these amazing capabilities. If you like our content, hit like, subscribe, and ring the bell to, to receive notifications of future events. We are joined this morning by Rear Admiral Bill Cobb, Naval Academy Class of 68, who served as PEO ships in his final job in the Navy. His background is impressive. As commanding officer of USS Kuntz, DDG-40, he rendered assistance to the USS Stark, a story we will weave in today's discussion. He served in NAVC as PMS-400F, Director of the Naval Surface Warfare Center, Indian Head, PEO TSC and PEO ships. Admiral Cobb's presence and leadership were involved in numerous and short notice repair efforts. Captain Rick Hepburn is the consummate pump kicker. And I say that with great esteem and, and pride. A class of 1976 graduate of the Naval Academy, he was further educated at MIT and served as a port engineer, ship superintendent, docking officer of the USS Missouri, force engineer for Surface Forces Atlantic Fleet, and as director, surface ship design, and as supervisor of shipbuilding for Bath Ironworks in Maine. He is the author of two books, The History of American Navy Ships of the Line, Lessons for the Navy Today, as well as The History of American Naval Dry Docks. He now owns and operates his own company, still serving our Navy, with his sons and daughter. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. The first thing I'd like you both to do is open with comments about why we should celebrate the great work of our shipyards and ship repair facilities. Coleman, <clears throat> begin. 
Yeah, good morning. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to, to be here this morning. I think an incredibly important subject that uh, doesn't get a lot of fanfare, but uh, I think we should be incredibly proud of the shipyards still left that do both new construction and of course some yards do both uh, repair and new construction and those yards that do repair to our Navy today. And because it's a tough business, tough uh, because the amount of ships in the Navy varies. Uh, the budget cycles cause a perturbation in the schedule. So it's really tough to stay in there. And we ought to be very, very proud of those that are left doing it. It's a tremendously reduced uh, from the time I was in the Navy in the 80s and 90s, where Admiral Cobb and I served uh, together back in those days. And we've lost a tremendous number of naval shipyards, which even used to do new construction and we've lost uh, repair yards as well. Uh, but the ones that are left are actually now booked and book solid. It gets in the press and now and again, although sometimes uh, because of ship schedules changing, uh, they end up with empty dry docks. But for the most part, we don't have enough dry docks. And when you think of um, the 297 ships I think we have today, and if we try to go up to 355, the amount of work to repair these ships, first of all, to build them, then to repair them. And these yards are near capacity. Now you gotta start thinking, uh, do we have enough shipyards? But that, that's some initial com comments, Admiral. <clears throat> Thanks, Rick. Uh, first of all, it, uh, I'd like to say it's a great pleasure for me to uh, be on this panel with uh, Captain Rick Hepburn. As he said, we served together for at least five years and longer than that. He was a consummate soup ships, bath, tremendous uh, uh, engineering duty officer and uh, confidant. Uh, I, I was very privileged to uh, have the opportunity to serve with him. That being said, I will, I will build on what he said about the shipyards. Uh, they've been absolutely critical to ship repair and taking care of ships in the life cycle since, since almost the time we had ships in the Navy. Uh, certainly from the World War II experiences, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the more recent experiences, the shipyards have provided the expertise and the capability to bring our damaged ships back online, whether the damage be from wartime, terrorism, or peacetime operations. And they've provided a critical role, both the naval shipyards, as Rick said, we've lost some of those, unfortunately, uh, but we have several civilian shipyards uh, who are doing acquisition and also life cycle support as well. We also have a lot of small shipyards in the various ports like San Diego and, and Norfolk, for example, uh, that do work in ship repair. And we depend on them a great deal uh, in a daily basis to keep our ships ready to go back to sea and to be fully repaired. So the bottom line is shipyards are extremely valuable and, and we'll talk a little bit about how they've uh, done wonderful things to keep our ships back on the line uh, for the fleet commanders. Uh, thank you both. Uh, for Captain Hepburn, going back to World War II, what mistake did the Japanese make at Pearl Harbor related to dry docks? Well, as was discussed at the onset with Yorktown uh, being dry docked, the fact that dry dock was there, that was the mistake. Uh, the Japanese did not destroy dry dock one and they did not destroy the dock right next door, dry dock two, <clears throat> braving docks there. They did uh, blow up the Shah, which was in a floater, which did sink. But uh, amazingly, within a month, they were able to raise that floating dry dock, even with the Shah in it, and were able to repair the Shah enough to get back. So they didn't, they didn't incapacitate the shipyard enough uh, the fact, like I said, that Dry Dock 1 was able to fat, to repair the ships that were caught in the dock during the attack. The Helena, the cruiser Helena, was docked uh, within three days after Pearl Harbor in Dry Dock 2. She was not, the Dry Dock was not uh, activated yet, uh, but they did activate because the drainage pumps worked and they were able to repair her. And she was, of course, uh, involved in much of the war. She was later lost. But uh, that was the big mistake. Uh, I was just going to add that uh, the Dewey was a floating dry dock that was at Sasebo. Uh, and she had been put there by the US Navy in 1906. 
And the day before Cregador and the surrender there, uh, the U.S. Navy had to finally try to, to, they sunk the dry dock, but the Japanese raised the dock, and that was such a threat uh, to have that capability there that the, the Army Air Corps bombed the dock and lost, they lost it again. So anyway, dry docks enter the picture here as a, as a force multiplier. And were there uh, other roles for flo floating dry docks uh, in the South Pacific worth mentioning? Uh, absolutely. So later on, uh, through some magnificent engineering, which we can still learn from today, they built these massive uh, sectional dry docks along with other smaller docks. And these were advanced base sectional docks. Uh, Admiral Cobb, you remember seeing that in Portland, one of them uh, that was still right. used by BOW into uh, the late uh, 90s. And these docks were put in the South Pacific, uh, eventually in Guam as well. And I was talking to a retired captain, Harry Jackson, uh, in 2000, God rest his soul, but he was able to tell me he served on one of these docks in the Western Pacific, and he docked over 300 ships, especially after uh, the battles of Okinawa, and able to keep ships out there in the Western Pacific without the massive transit and time lost back to the U.S. That, that's a great answer, and it kind of follows on the next question I'm going to direct to Admiral Cobb. But uh, one of our audience today in front of the foundation, Jamie McGrath, uh, has read an article arguing that the majority of damaged vessels were not repaired in time to return to combat before the war ended. Is this your opinion? And can you cite some examples of where other important ships were repaired and brought back into action? Yeah, I certainly can. Um, I would uh, take a little bit of issue with the author of that article. Uh, let me give you an example, a couple of examples. Number one, uh, the battleships at Pearl Harbor that were <clears throat> destroyed, with the exception of the Utah and the Arizona, uh, I believe I'm correct, is within a year of the Pearl Harbor attack, those battleships were back in service, uh, back in the fight again, due in large measure to the shipyards and the dry docks that Rick refers to, um, the, the first part of that. Uh, they were back in service within a year of the uh, of the attack on Pearl Harbor. So as Rick said, the problem was that uh, Admiral Yamamoto, who was in charge of planning the Pearl Harbor attack, he said afterwards when they were congratulating him, the Japanese uh, officers on his staff on, on what a great job they had done in, in, uh, in the Pearl Harbor attack, he mused and said, I fear that we have awakened a sleeping giant. And what he was referring to, of course, was a tremendous capability that the United States had, of which he was greatly familiar, having been in the United States in the 20s and the 30s, and actually having gone to graduate school there for a small amount of time. He knew the tremendous industrial might uh, of, of the uh, United States and knew that this would be a real problem for the Japanese. And of course, he was correct. A lot of that industrial might had to do with uh, dry docks and with uh, as regards the ones in the South Pacific and, and around, I know my dad served, class of 43 at the Academy, served in World War II on, on two ships that were dry docked in, I believe, Tulagi, uh, as an example of, of these some 300 that uh, Captain Jackson had docked uh, in, in World War II. So the ability to get these ships back on the line, uh, certainly the great majority of them, that were uh, that had damage that could be repaired was one of the turning points in in the war, and the Japanese just couldn't compete uh, with that kind of industrial might, and a lot of that had to do with shipyards. Thank you. Uh, this question uh, is for both panelists, and it comes from Captain Tim Oliver, the executive director of the Navy Submarine League, and Trident Scholar from the Naval Academy class of '69, and he asks your opinions on the lack of STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, math, slash industrial arts classes in our high schools, and the overall effect on the paucity of an adequate workforce, which might lead to diminished force readiness. Uh, are the people coming out of the colleges uh, up to the task of uh, doing the business of our Navy shipbuilding and repair? Uh, start with you, Rick. Well, uh, what Huntington Ingalls at Newport News does and other shipyards, uh, especially new construction, they have massive apprentice programs. 
and to even become a journeyman you don't go right from high school right into the shipyard there's like a four-year program that do offer associates degrees but it takes a massive amount of training it includes welding and ship fitting and being electricians and so the shipyards themselves and they do get some government support from states and federal to to do some of that but i think it's it's really an important program so obviously uh it's very important for them to try to to get these folks as early as possible and, and the faster they could especially we have to ramp up quickly and we don't have four years to train uh people to be journeymen uh so I think what they're trying to do is team with Old Dominion has a good relationship with uh, the Navy and the shipyards. Uh, and I think that needs to continue. I think one of the problems now is with with workload kind of varying in some of these yards, they really rely on a lot of temporary work. Uh, the, the problem with that is that the shipyards themselves don't control uh, these these workers and the training as much as if they were actual employees, but they're kind of forced to use a lot of temps for that. But uh, the other thing is when we had uh, tenders, uh, the destroyer tenders, I was a tender repair officer. Uh, this was a great training platform for sailors that when they got out of the Navy after a couple of enlistments, uh, that they were at a journeyman, a department of labor journeyman level. And we don't have those platforms today. We do have some short intermediate maintenance activities, but we're not training as many sailors. So that, that caused a shortage too. So it's very important. We're in, companies uh, to and, and shipyards to work with the high schools to to try to uh, leverage and of course uh, the politicians if they can if they can help in the education of of what i call artificers i can tell you that uh, bath ironworks and other yards that do new construction and the repair yards some of this work isn't um, something you learn in school you have to actually be on the deck plates and grandfathers teaching dads and sons how to put shafting in and to align shafting, um, that that is an art. And that's why they're called artificers. <laughs> so, and that takes time to learn. Uh, Bill, what are your thoughts, sir? Well, I, I agree with everything Rick said. Let me add a few things. Uh, in general, I think uh, we are uh, behind in STEM type courses, both in uh, uh, junior colleges and in colleges. Um, uh, we don't, uh, we need many more people taking those courses. One of the reasons is they're hard, they're difficult. It's not the same thing as majoring in some of the easier majors. Uh, a lot of times an engineering degree will require five years instead of four. Uh, industry, uh, as well as the Navy, uh, are looking for those engineers to uh, take over uh, very important positions in NAFC and other places. As Rick says, uh, in the shipyards in particular with these apprentice programs and going to journeymen, and, and one thing he said, which I particularly agree with, and that is the uh, passing down of the skill levels to uh, people from, uh, as he said, grandfathers, but people of that age uh, are very, very important things that you can't learn in school. But we have a real paucity of people taking STEM courses today, I think, I think our educational system needs to take a hard look at that. Uh, and the bottom line is, I know Rick went to MIT, uh, I went to Naval Academy, then went to uh, postgraduate school and, and other graduate schools. And when you take these technical courses, they are very difficult. So students tend to shy away from them. Another aspect of this is the shortage of these skilled laborers. Uh, when Hurricane Katrina hit, now let's use Pascagoula as a, uh, Engel Shipyard down in Pascagoula is an example. My recollection is they lost about 20% of their workforce because of the, uh, the hurricane, the, the effects of the hurricane. Uh, the shipyard was damaged, obviously. They were able to get back online, uh, I thought, in a, in a tremendously short amount of time compared to the damage that they suffered with this great hurricane. But they lost a lot of shipyard workers who went to other places and, and that skill level uh, was not there. Uh, and that, of course, just exacerbated the, the uh, uh, acquisition, especially of DDGs, the Aegis DDGs that were being built down there and some of the ships that were being repaired. Uh, one of the things that we didn't talk about, but just as an example, uh, a, a lot of shipyards do not only acquisition, not a lot, but some do acquisition, but they also do ship repair. 
So there's always competing priorities in the shipyard uh, as to uh, which jobs get the most priority, et cetera. That has to be very carefully balanced by the Navy, by NAVC, uh, by the different codes in NAVC, and the PEOs and the fleet commanders, of course. And, uh, and that, when, when you lose 20% of your workforce, that just, again, exacerbates the problem of scheduling. So this is a problem that we've got to work on in the future. Uh, we've got a huge bill coming up of, of uh, backload of uh, ship maintenance to the tune of some 32 billion by the estimates of GAO that have to be taken care of in the future. And we need the, the skilled labor to do that. And we're all looking for skilled labor. And uh, when you take a welder, for example, especially uh, a submarine type welder, and especially with the subsafe program and things like that, level one welding, you can't teach that in just a few hours or a few days or a few months. It takes years of experience uh, to do that. We need to retain those kind of people in the STEM situation, the people that are, are educated in STEM things and welding is just one example. You, you know, uh, the welding is a very skilled, highly skilled uh, thing that you do. And these guys are hard to find. So it's a problem, something we have to work on. I, I was just going to add, if you don't mind, Admiral, that uh, you, you look at the Columbia class uh, submarine. That right. a lot, I mean, we're reconstituting, rebuilding our, our strategic uh, triad for the, at least the maritime right. portion of it. And that is a difficult ship, the electric boat and the whole Navy reactors team and all the, all of the industries across the country involved with that <coughs> people. So there's a great challenge ahead. Also, if you look out a little further to the DGX program, uh, that's not going to be uh, a design produced overseas. This is going to be a design right. produced in the United States, which is a great opportunity to kind of showcase uh, naval architecture, naval engineering again, as uh, something that's going to be interesting to work on. I think you've got to put something out there that's going to draw people to our industry back. Yeah, can I add one other thing, Rick? I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, one of the things that, that is still going on that I think is unfortunate, and that is the role of women in, in STEM courses and in, in uh, taking engineering courses. As you and I know, uh, in headquarters of uh, PEO, TSC, and also PEO ships, we had very few women engineers because they don't tend to take engineering courses in college. I know uh, one of my cousins uh, just graduated as a mechanical engineer at Florida, and she got a tremendous number of job offers. But in fact, unfortunately, women don't tend to take these courses sometimes. Uh, they'll be uh, my cousin told me that she was one of only three women, uh, and there's no reason for that. Obviously, women can do this. We had some tremendous uh, engineers, uh, very few of them, but at, at several of them in headquarters who are doing just fine. Uh, Billy Anna Anderson comes to mind, now Des and Ships, uh, and some others. Uh, we need to tap that market and, and encourage um, them to do this. Uh, we. You know, there's no reason why we can't do it, but we need more of them and more of the, the STEM-like workers. And the new Columbia class is a great example, as is the, and the new frigate, which is coming online too, uh, which is going to need this kind of expertise. Great. Uh, thanks for that question, uh, Tim Oliver. That was a great one, and it's uh, it's real important and a real important investment to uh, a whole host of uh, of occupations in our country. Uh, I want to share a sea story, and I and I think that the best way that history is presented is uh, is through storytelling, and uh, this is a no kidding <laughs> a story involving uh, me and, and my ship, the USS Paul F. Foster, and uh, the uh, president of South Korea had been assassinated in 1979, and in uh, the Coral Sea Strike Group was uh, ordered to make haste to be within a 96 hour uh, period, uh, a distance of, of the um, of the area, and uh, we were in a, a pretty mighty uh, storm, uh, Sea State 7 and higher, green water over the bow, this type of thing, uh, and green water on the flight deck of the carrier. And uh, it caused a casualty to our sonar dome rubber window where it deflated, and I could go into a lot of detail about it, but just suffice it to say, we had to base, basically limp into 
Guam at uh, Bear Steerage Way, about 100 miles uh, as it was. Um, and of course, uh, we had some extraordinary leadership under the command of Captain Lee Case. Uh, department heads were uh, Bill Keating, um, Chuck Vogan, and, and uh, Paul Schultz. And of course, uh, I wrote the CAS rep. I was the ASW officer. We came in to, uh, to Guam, and of course, the, uh, the materials uh, officers of the uh, crew des group staff, as well as the Desron, Clint Adams, to be exact, uh, were on the pier, and we had divers go down and, and revealed a pretty substantial amount of damage, which informed a, uh, the first sit rep. So uh, here's the point. Within 30 hours, NAVC is in Guam with a new sonar dome rubber window. Okay, think about this. A C5 loaded with a, a sonar dome rubber window with a ton of uh, great people show up. And, and within seven weeks, we're back in battery. And uh, the NAVC team not only came aboard our ship, but they actually behaved as shipmates and were accepted as shipmates. And they worked around the clock and, and the, with this horrific casualty that uh, had all kinds of intricate issues, you know, and a lot of uh, uh, post event testing uh, on the bead seed and on staves and elements. There's 576 of those, uh, receiver sensitivity, source level, all kinds of different attributes that, uh, that go along with this. It's not just the, the, the integrity of the seal uh, of this big piece of rubber from Goodyear. And so the simple point was that the right people came, then they left and, and, and folks came in in waves and we were back and we were in the, in the Persian Gulf about nine weeks later, 10 weeks later. And, uh, and that can't be done with an incompetent group that doesn't know what they're doing. This is, this right. is stuff that folks had been trained and, and, and were ready for. And literally when they were called, they responded in seconds, literally. So I wanna see uh, first, uh, if you wanna pile on with that, uh, Admiral Cobb, and maybe there's some perspectives uh, that involve the Stark, Cole, Leyte Gulf, even the Sam, Samuel B. Roberts, you know, so, and then, and then I'll ask uh, Captain Hepburn to jump in behind you. Uh, what do you have to say about that, Admiral Cobb? Well, Admiral Masso, that's a great uh, story. It's certainly a true story. Uh, I will say that's symbolic of how people react, how our, our technical people react when there's a problem. Uh, I'll give you some specific examples. Uh, I was on scene of the, the Stark. Uh, I was CEO of a, of a Terrier DDG, the Kuntz. Uh, they relieved me that night that they got hit. Uh, I went in to get fuel and uh, I'd just gotten back into port and several hours later they got hit by two missiles from uh, Exocets from a uh, Mirage fighter, uh, Iraq, and you know their story. Uh, one of them exploded. Uh, the other one did not explode, but spilled rocket fuel all through the ship. And uh, we learned several lessons just from that episode. Uh, but in any case, um, the Stark crew who'd lost uh, perhaps 30, 40% of their crew killed or injured, uh, 37 were killed uh, right off the bat, and uh, many, many more were injured. Uh, the uh, commander of Middle East Force at the time sent us, sent our fire party out there, uh, plus the two ships, the Cunningham and the Waddell, out to assist in fighting a fire, which we did for, for many hours. Uh, meanwhile, uh, almost immediately, the NAVC folks and PEO folks showed up at the airport. And uh, even before uh, we were able to tow Stark into Bahrain, uh, they were they were on the pier waiting to uh, to meet them as they as they got to the pier. Uh, the moral of that story it was pretty incredible. What they decided to do uh, was to try and repair the Stark enough to get it so it could get back to the United States on its own power. Uh, that took about four months in the Bahraini shipyard to do that, assisted by NAVC and also a tender was uh, put out there as well. Um, so it, it was symbolic of, of, of how we do things and have done things since, you know, since we had ships. And that is, regardless of what ship class it is or where it's from, if there is a disaster or a problem or battle damage or a grounding or a collision, 
um, the powers that be, the NAFCs and the CNO and the, and the fleet commanders and the PEOs working together, make sure that the right people, technical people are on scene with the right equipment and the right parts to fix it before anybody gets into how much money is this gonna cost and all the other bureaucratic things that you have to do later, investigations, et cetera. The object is to get the ship safely back to sea again to care for the remaining crew. And in the case of Stark, this is exactly what happened. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough on Kuntz to escort them back along with the other two ships back to the East Coast where they got the full overhaul and now, uh, and, and then later became a full fledged uh, member of the fleet. Another great example of this was the, uh, was the coal. Um, the coal was hit, as you recall, by a terrorist bomb in, in Yemen. Um, they were on a fuel dolphin, uh, badly damaged. Uh, within hours, again, uh, arriving at the airport was a whole technical team of experts to try and assess the damage, to, to figure out what we were going to do with the ship and how to repair it. Uh, of course, Yemen is a different uh, country than Bahrain. Bahrain had more facilities, was a, certainly a friendly. Uh, Yemen has had a, a checkered history of, of civil war, etc. cetera. And, um, and in any case, people flew out from the, uh, from the United States and from other places to assess the damage and get on with business. It was decided, uh, I had the notion that, uh, to put in my two cents, that why don't we put this uh, ship on another ship uh, to bring it back that way, uh, rather than to, to keep it in, in Yemen for four or five months to try and get it seaworthy, um, and which was not really a tenable thing to do. That's how the Blue Marlin came into, uh, and as you all remember, the Blue Marlin was kind of like a, a floating dry dock, if you will. You bring the, uh, they were used to taking oil derricks around the world. Uh, we called them up. Uh, they were able to uh, say that, yes, the, we gave them the dimensions of the ship, the displacement. Uh, they thought they were able to do that, and they did do that. We floated the, uh, uh, the coal over the, uh, the deck. The deck came up. They rested on blocks. We, uh, we put tethers on the blocks, and, uh, and I say we, uh, the NAVC experts and the other experts from shipyard, uh, we, we tethered it down to withstand... Uh, I believe at the time, 40-foot uh, seas, up to 40-foot seas and 80-knot winds. Uh, they took the, uh, uh, the Blue Marlin took the ship all the way around the Horn of Africa back to Pascagoula, where it was later uh, repaired and is now a, 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 you know, a, a nice member of the fleet. It was a great example of what Sonny was talking about, uh, getting the people out there who are the real experts right now not waiting for all the other bureaucratic things that might happen. As a, one of the things that I had to do personally was go brief the head of the Armed Services Committee, Senator John Warner, the late John Warner. And uh, the first question he asked me is, what are we gonna do about repair? And the second question is, how much is it gonna cost? And uh, the cost was just north of 200 million, as I recall. Uh, we actually came in under budget and gave the Navy back 30 or $40 million as it underwent a, uh, an overhaul at Engels. The hardest part of that brief for me was convincing Senator Warner that even though it was a Norfolk ship, we wanted to get it repaired at Engels because we were still building DDGs. That was the yard that it was built in. Uh, we had parts and, and all kinds of other things in the, in the line uh, as we built three or four or five DDGs a year. And we could use those parts and the specialized cranes and modules to uh, affect Good repairs. So as another example, again, these are two examples of how we, uh, and the same with the Lady Gulf when they lost their bow in a collision, we had that repaired within three weeks and they went on deployment. Um, this is an example of how, uh, and this really started with a lot of people, uh, certainly Admiral uh, uh, Rickover of submarines, when submarine had a technical problem of any kind, uh, he sent the real experts out there immediately, as did Admiral Meyer when he started Aegis. And uh, with, in, in, you know, in concert with uh, the NAVC folks, the technical experts from the civilian community, the Navy and all the other people, the fleet people, uh, they got on scene immediately. And this capability is what has distinguished us from other countries 
potential adversaries, our ability to do that. We have the ability to do that today. We did it with the two ships that had collisions, uh, the two DDGs out of Japan, and we will continue to do it. Unfortunately, we still have these things that happen. Uh, we don't wait around for a lot of bureaucracy. We get on the problem immediately so we can return these pressure ships back to, uh, uh, back to full up operational status, all with the proviso of being safe, the safety of the crew, and that's, of course, paramount. Now, long for, answer didn't mean to be that long-winded, but it's... Uh, for, you, for you, Captain Hepburn, uh, of course, uh, everything centered in the repair of the Paul F. Foster around being uh, docked on AFDM-8, which is a submarine dry dock. Without that submarine dry dock, there's no repair capability in the same sense, or it certainly it wouldn't take six or seven weeks. It'd be profoundly longer. What are your, what are, what, how would you like to pile on to this, uh, given uh, what Ca Admiral Cobb said in, in the, uh, in the whole dry dock uh, part? But just a couple of things that we were very fortunate that Blue Marlin was available. I think she happened to be in the area at the time. Otherwise, it could have been a month to get another ship there. So, True. and we were, uh, depending on it, that the military sea lift command actually had, had a charter the Blue Marlin. She's not in our inventory, she's a foreign flag uh, ship. So we were fortunate in that case. Uh, I would also say that the dry dock at Guam is not, it's not there anymore. Uh, it just got too old and it's elsewhere and it's not available for the US Navy out there. So you run into, I think with the Fitzgerald um, case and McCain, we were able to use uh, the Yakuska with our relationship with Japan, very fortunate. But right now we're, we need, in my opinion, we could use a dry dock at, at Guam, I know the uh, USS San Francisco, a submarine casualty happened. They At that time, there was a dock existed there, and they've had another casualty since then. They had to steam the submarine on the surface to get it back to the West Coast. So it's kind of obvious to me, especially world events, that we had to strongly consider a dry dock out at Guam, maybe a sectional dock, something we can actually build in the United States. We don't uh, with the exception of a dock for electric boat, we don't build dry docks in the United States right now. Could be done. Could be done as, as a sectional dock, the World War II AF, uh, the Advanced Base Sectional Docks, ABSDs, were built in multiple yards. I believe like eight different yards. You can build a barge size, you can build these sections and assemble it, and then you could tow them by section out to where you need it. Um, and they built seven of those docks for World War II. I think it can be done. You can utilize the, the yards that are not caught up in ship construction and repair, you sub-tier maybe two or three yards as a possibility. The other thing is tenders. Uh, I think there's a solicitation out now to restart replacing as one of the sub-tenders, one or two of the sub-tenders. Uh, we don't have destroyer tenders now, but uh, again, they could be a deployed maintenance source. And again, that's a great way to train sailors and you, these sailors rotate off ships, like Admiral Cobb was commanding officer of, and, and you, sir, Sonny, uh, you, uh, you had sailors that went to a tender in IMA, got trained up and went back to those ships and were highly skilled, basically journeyman level uh, sailors that could help repair ships. So that'd be a couple ways I think we need to keep an eye on the ball because uh, uh, we have less capability now than we did 20 years ago. So we just gotta pay attention to that. Yeah, and, uh, and it's interesting as a segue, a former commander in chief of the United States Atlantic Fleet, which is what it was called at the time, Admiral Bob Natter, who's no stranger to this show, asks, uh, and I'm gonna uh, roll it over to you, uh, Admiral Cobb first, what lessons learned from the past inform the need to prioritize today's investments in maintenance and repair? So that, you know, we've sort of been talking about that. And then his second part, is, is really been answered uh, by Captain Hepburn. There still seems to be a need for repair ships for forward deployment. What are your thoughts? And, and, um, and this one will be specific to you, Admiral Cobb. Well, I, it's always a great honor to be associated uh, on a panel uh, to talk with uh, Admiral Natter, who I consider to be, he's a, he's a close friend, but he's also a distinguished naval officer who fully understands uh, this, this question that he asked about priorities and things like that. He and I worked very closely together when I was PEO and he was Sinclair Fleet on a number of issues that had to do with priorities. Uh, by way of 
uh, my background earlier on in my career, I was in the uh, uh, Oppo 90 N8 community, uh, putting together budgets and helping put together POMs and budgets and things like that. And I and my personal opinion is the fleet commanders at the time were not given enough representation in OpNav to to get their priorities through. So they they formed an office in OpNav to help them uh, get their priorities into the budget process. And this is key. Uh, I obviously what we're doing in the Materiel Command, uh, whether we be PEOs or NAVC or whatever is we're supporting the combatant commanders, the fleet commanders, the pointy end of the spear. That's our whole job, to support them and to make sure that they have the, uh, the, the assets they need when they need them, uh, full up and ready to go so they can answer the call from the National Command Authority for anything that might arise. And we've worked on this together. Um, it's a tough job. Uh, we only have a certain amount of money given to us by Congress, certainly, the material command gets X number of dollars. The fleet commander gets X number of dollars. He's got readiness issues of his own. Certainly flight hours, paying for those, paying for uh, steaming hours, uh, paying for repairs, etc. So it's, uh, it's a collaboration, if you will, a very close collaboration that needs to take place to determine these priorities. But always in the back of our minds, we should remember that we're there to support the fleet. That's the bottom line. So uh, I hope we did a, uh, a good enough job for him, uh, at least in most cases. There were times where we had to make some very tough decisions. Shock trials comes to mind. We're gonna talk about that a little later, but, um, but, the, um, but the bottom line again is that the material command in setting priorities for readiness and for doing uh, shipyard repairs and repairs, uh, SRAs, et cetera, of the ships that come back from deployment have to go back out again. Uh, that's done very closely with the fleet uh, to set priorities. Um, there's no, it, it should be seamless um, and, and uh, we should do this together. That's the only way it works. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, so we've got a lot of questions and I wanna get through them all. So that, this isn't a criticism, but uh, if we can be less loquacious, uh, I, I really want to get to these because they're important questions from uh, some really solid citizens in our audience. Um, Dale Baugh, uh, who is a foundation member in class of 72, surface nuke and uh, engineering duty officer, asks, how do you assess the skill capability of today's journeyman sailors compared to those that repaired Yorktown? Really good question. Uh, Captain Hepburn, thoughts first. Well, uh, my compliments to uh, Admiral Bob, my boss, when I was Super Ship Bath, he was CO4 at the time. I have unbelievable respect for, for Dale Bob and enjoyed working for him. A uh, very astute uh, naval engineer and a great question. Uh, I've seen some examples lately and some work I'm doing and some maybe not the top tier yards, but second tier yards where they haven't experienced some things in, in relationship to installing shafting or things where you really need an artificer. And so we're really getting down to a few people in the country that can do some of these, uh, these things because we're not building that many ships so they're, or even repairing compared to what we used to. So the number of people involved on the job training that's happening is, uh, I think there's limited numbers and, and that's that's a concern. So I think we need to really watch that very closely. I mean, the intelligence, the enthusiasm, the conscientiousness of the people going in the yards, I think are still fantastic, uh, but they're not seeing things at the rip, at the rapid level. I mean, look at, uh, if you're only gonna build one or two destroyers, one destroyer a year in a ship like shipyard like Bath Arm Works, uh, that's a problem because you don't see, you're not going from one, the same job to the same job to the same job. There's a huge gap. Uh, and then you have to perhaps rely on temporary employees. And that's a real risk as you're trying to uh, have a production line. Uh, Admiral Cobb. Uh, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think again, back to, and, and uh, the short answer is that, uh, uh, 
what Rick just alluded to, the temporary workers, uh, we, we want to keep as many permanent people in journeyman as we can. Uh, it takes a hell of a lot of training uh, to, to uh, do uh, both apprentice and journeyman. We've got to keep at this. This is a real problem that we've got to keep at. Um, I, I think they're certainly they were skilled labor back in World War II, uh, obviously. Uh, when you think about it, the president said, okay, uh, Henry J. Kaiser and Henry Ford's family, et cetera, you're not going to make cars anymore. You're going to make airplanes and ships and, and tanks and things like that. Uh, some of that skill level transferred over, but but the specific skill level of these journeymen, we have to pay very close attention to. This is a and, and, I, and I think part of the answer, Dale, is also uh, bureau policies, and this is uh, this is unique and something I think that should be addressed. That forty, yeah. you know, when you were in the enterprise, you know, back as a young uh, nuclear officer. Uh, all, most all of the shore duty were in home port. You know, you, there were mo mobile training units that don't exist anymore. There was prodigious shore duty opportunities on the waterfront right. that don't exist anymore. Yep. Now we have uh, an incongruent uh, philosophy where, where you see these rates that have a five and two sh seashore rotation. It's, it's, it's really a joke because uh, the shore duty that they're being pushed to are recruiting or pushing boots, and those are 36 month assignments. And then if you add an individual augmentation, as we saw for 20 years in this in this war that just ended, uh, you're you're finding uh, this third, the second class petty officer, fire controlman on an Aegis cruiser, who's the sharpest uh, petty officer on the ship, leaves the ship, and not only does he go away for four years in some cases, but when he returns or if she returns there's three different uh, baselines that have changed. And so this person is, is now a first class, less effective than they were as a second class. And this is a broken system. And when I was Bupers, I got this call every day, every single day from someone on the waterfront. Hey, our guys are showing up. The, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're, they wanna be great, but they can't be because they've been away for four years, three years. So anyway, uh, on, to the, on to the next question. That was a good question. Uh, Captain Phil Resch from Dallas, Texas asks, <laughs> is there data tracking, is there data tracking the savings on maintenance as related to crew reduction? So when you reduce a crew size by 10%, what happens to the 3M maintenance system? Any thoughts on that, Admiral Cobb? Yeah, I, again, I'll give you the, in the interest of time, a short answer. I. I had many, uh, as a PEO, I, I funded several studies on that exact question. Uh, and it was clearly obvious that some of the newer ships that were coming down the line, uh, specifically the, the uh, Zumwalt class and LCS, et cetera, were going to have reduced crews. Uh, were you saving money uh, by doing that? Uh, and over and above the, the normal questions like, for example, if you have a reduced crew, how do you fight a fire? all these, leaving those questions aside for the time being. Yeah, you certainly will get savings. And, and one of the things that's kind of interesting is that from a budget point of view, the real cost of a ship is not the acquisition cost, it's the life cycle cost, especially if it's uh, gonna be in service for 35 or 40 years. If you take all the salaries, the, the fuel, et cetera, and, and add that all up, it greatly dwarfs the initial cost of the ship. So uh, if you reduce the crew size, yeah, there should be savings. Uh, but there's all kinds of other problems with doing that. Uh, and uh, some of them are political, some of them are uh, other, other problems. But yeah, you should see, and there, is, uh, there are data systems to track that. Uh, we did many studies on this. I assume they're still doing it today. Uh, the new DDGX, I'm not sure if we know yet what the crew size is gonna be or the new frigate. Uh, but I'm sure that they're doing these kinds of studies like we did. Uh, Captain Hepburn, thoughts? Uh, just a, a quick, uh, some anecdotal information here, but uh, I, I've been hiring some fire controlmen, got out of the Navy for some work we do out at Wallops Island. And one of these uh, gentlemen uh, told me when he, on his last cruiser, I've never heard of this happening before. This used to be uh, something that would never happen, that as a fire controlman, he was asked by engineering to go out, go down and help with something in the plant because he knew enough to, 
to be an electrician basically help out so that's kind of new so you're really having to be yeah. captains of ships have to be very innovative the, the one concern i have if you're not doing it maintenance because the maintenance is still there and still accumulates it's not as bad as the old steamships but it's, it's still there a lot of means to do damage control and other things that the commanding officer of the ship kind of loses control if everything's being contracted out and but he's still responsible that 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 work was done yeah. adequately on a cruise ship that I, I was involved in one case where they were contracting out work on a co2 system and a valve was put in backwards when they had a major shipboard fire that system did not work uh so if there's some danger there's some I guess uh, you're losing control of the maintenance, and it's probably making COs kind of a concern, I'm sure. You guys were COs, and I'm sure it makes you a little nervous. <laughs> yeah, so uh, a couple questions piled on top of one another just to get to them. Uh, Charles Bogart asks, uh, uh, generically, do we have the capability to build ships using only items produced in the United States? And then a question, not really related, but just just a se separate question. Is there any best practices, lessons learned, things of that nature from the cruise industry do dry docking experiences uh, that make can make them more efficient or you know applicable to our purposes? Uh, we'll start with you, Captain Hepburn. So, can we build ships, in your opinion, using only items produced in the United States first? And then the, the dry docking of this is a huge issue and we're going to need congressional help on this uh, <laughs> it, the industrial base is uh really getting squeezed like cable manufacturers like one cable manufacturer left in america uh and that's can you imagine that the backlog they have uh and it's causing problems not only in the navy construction but in uh, coast guard construction as well and you have a lot of vendors that have disappeared in the U.S. So a lot of the shipbuilding now still pulls in products from overseas. That is a very good question. Could we? I think there's some work to be done to make sure that's the case. And you want more than one. You want two so you can have some competition. Because it's extremely dangerous just to have one. Um, just to jump to, to the cruise industry, uh, remember these ships are constructed uh, per and they're under the rules of a classification society like the American Bureau of Shipping or Lloyd's of London so it, that they're under different rule sets and again they don't have uh, the worrisome uh, concern of like battle damage uh, they have some damage control obviously fighting fires but not weapon effects and dealing with the weapon systems so it's much more complicated uh, for a warship to be built and much more, many more standards, military standards involved for, and for good reason, they're all learned in blood uh, the hard way. So, but the cruise ships are under uh, commercial standards. So it's just really a different, different ball game. Anything to add to that, uh, Admiral Cobber? Or... Well, I, uh, that quite, that big issue you're talking about, can, uh, can we build ships uh, using just American uh, parts and American, ingenuity and technology. Yeah, we probably could, but that's a huge question that's way beyond my pay grade. Uh, that's, uh, that gets to Congress and their interests and the, and the president. Uh, and uh, there's the Jones Act, there's the Buy America, there's uh, all kinds of other things that happen. Uh, generally speaking, um, it doesn't happen in some of the newer ships that, generally speaking, that all the parts and all the, the, the parts of the ship are, are built in America necessarily. What typically happens, for example, Rolls-Royce, which makes engines and things like that, even though they're based overseas, they have US entities in the US uh, doing things. So it gets pretty complicated. I'm not smart enough to figure out, uh, frankly, uh, what all the ins and outs of that are, but I do agree with Rick. Um, we have to be careful uh, how we do this. Uh, there's always the notion, for example, how come we, you know, for a new frigate, if we want to build a new frigate or a new ship, how come we don't go overseas and buy one of the ones that some other country uh, built already and has had experience with? Well, there's a lot of problems with that politically. So I don't mean to duck the question, but it's a huge issue. No, you didn't, you didn't duck the question. I, I've, I've got a, there's a lot of energy right now. Yeah. 
around uh, comments like the George Washington and how the crew, the perception that the crew was not treated well. And, and of course, who hasn't gotten uh, 14 texts from friends asking why certain ships look like there's more rust than there is, you know, haze gray paint and all this kind of thing. And I'm gonna come to that. Uh, and that'll be the last question just in general. But I do wanna talk about welding for a second. So NSWC Carterock, which is one of the, it's a treasure in our, in our system. You know, nobody really ever hears about it. You know about Port Wyneme, you know about Indian Head, you know about the former White Oak, you know, and that type of thing. And, but Carterock did some amazing work with friction steer welding. And they had a, um, a GS-15 that was a PhD, uh, Dr. Maria Posada by name, and, uh, and we, we have been doing some amazing work in friction stir welding. And uh, one of the two of you take it and just explain what it is and where you see it in our future. I, I can probably take that one. Uh, we're in that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, friction stir welding, basically, uh, you're putting like a rod down, you're, you're spinning it between two plates and you're, you're, you're actually able to, with the heat, just to kind of join these two plates together without a lot of welding going on. It's just another method of raising the heat and joining it. Uh, you might lower the, uh, what they call the heat affected zones. You're not disrupting the material as much. So it's a, it is a, a new method. Even uh, additive manufacturing off, offers a lot of promise promise there. Mm -hmm. But um, I think uh, Card Rock does a great job of looking at new technologies. We work, actually my business, we work with Carter Rock quite a bit and we need their approval that we can actually do a process on a ship. So they put uh, a process through massive testing. And I think uh, there's some great folks over there, some of the country's best um, as far as some material engineers. Uh, and so uh, they are a great help to the shipyards uh, also use them and programs like the uh, National Shipbuilding a research project uh, allows uh, some R&D money to flow into shipyards so they can introduce new welding procedures or new welding equipment, joining equipment, cutting equipment, uh, material uh, treatment. So um, I think it's it's pretty good. Uh, and we can learn a lot from aerospace as well and offshore. Uh, and that's one thing we need to keep. It, it's just not what we know in the Navy, but you got to look around the world. What, what are they using? And so to keep the radar on for all that is very important. Car Rock does a pretty good job. Well, you know, C.F. Snyder uh, from the Naval Academy class of 69 was the uh, technical director and the cutting edge work they did was just extraordinary in his tenure. And I'm sure it continues today. I just am, don't yeah, not as familiar. But I will say, um, <clears throat> if you could only see the discussion that's going on in the midst of what, you know, y'all are talking about, <laughs> Because, um, you know, there are so many passionate foundation members and they're, and they're speaking right now, you know, even though you can't see it. You know, they're, they're engaged in our YouTube uh, chat box and, they're, and, they're, and their points are just amazing. And, of course, we're trying to, you know, to celebrate ship maintenance and repair. And, and there's not, uh, and I'm not trying to suggest that there's a, a, a cohort that's not trying to celebrate, but everyone wants our Navy to be better. And when, when you see, you know, minimally manned ships that, you know, that don't really look at the Naval Manpower Analysis Center models, I'm going to LCS specifically, you know, where they, it's, you know, generally uh, NAVMAC works on a required operational capability in a projected operating environment. And it had asked questions like, do you want to have a helo, one helo, two helos? There's a manpower bill that is assigned to that. How many stations do you want to refuel? Or take water. Do you want? Do you have a a, a midships retractable king post? You know, all of these things require personnel. How many repair lockers? All these things, and then it's all done in the context of the apprentice journeyman master of petty officers and seamen and things that 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 go up the 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 chain. And of course, when we violate the time honored, you know, uh, tenants of NAVMAC, for example, uh, then we uh, then things, you know, we stumble on things. And so ships look bad. Is that a reflection on a poor crew? You know, maybe it is, probably it's not, okay? And so 
then this whole thing where Mick Pond goes out to uh, Smith, Russ Smith, and he's one of our best Mick Ponds we've ever had. But, you know, he, get, he gets, you know, beat up by the George Washington crew over like habitability stuff, you know, stuff that, you know, who's doing my laundry, uh, the living conditions, you know, food and beverage, you know, this type of thing. And, uh, and so we're, we're kind of in a place and the, the discussions are centered around many of those tenants. And, uh, and again, we're, we're intending here to celebrate uh, ship repair and maintenance, but yet there are some legitimate concerns uh, expressed by our audience. And I'm gonna ask in your final comments as we wind this down to address some of those things, if you don't mind. And I'm gonna start with you, Captain Hepburn, uh, as you kind of reflect on where you think we are, where we, you hope we should be, and any other comments that go with that. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I think uh, it's to deal with a crew when it's in a shipyard is uh, always, this uh, problem's been around for a long time, like 100 years, and uh, the Navy kind of cycles between, hey, maybe we should decommission the ship and turn it over to the shipyard, and move the crews elsewhere, uh, so they're not in the shipyard environment. Uh, but that makes it a little harder to reconstitute the ship at the end. I know in new construction and uh, under leadership, Admiral Cobb, we had the pre-com crews there, but we kept them off the ship and we trained them in a building and we built the crew gradually, brought them in slowly, but a very methodical process to, so they were ready to take the ship and get through their inspections. They had to get through to get the ship to do sail away. So I think there's some lessons, new construction. There is an issue with, nuclear power, which they don't decommission the power plant completely, depending on what the availability is. Uh, so that Naval Reactors has their requirements. Uh, they're a little different. Um, but uh, I think that you have to uh, pay uh, close attention uh, to what happens in yards. We saw the problem with the Bahamas Shard. It was really the ship had been moved out of GD NASCO over to the Naval Station. So the ship there had a little less control. It was a little harder for the regional maintenance center, probably, I don't know all the details there, but you can see that was kind of unique. The Navy was trying to save money and bring it out of the yard. Um, and so, but the officers responsible for maintenance and the crew and of course the chain of command, that kind of, it's a little tough, even the Naval Station, they lose control there, but, and your ability to deal with the crew, especially uh, if the crew could be offsite at a hotel, talk about a, that could lead to some problems even. <laughs> So, uh, but I think it's um, Admiral uh, Admiral Cobb. That this becomes a real nightmare for the CEO. I think in some of this. Yeah. Well, I, I know uh, after we returned from the Persian Gulf, we had an SRA docking SRA, and some young kid. We were fixing some uh, stuff up forwards. Those showers didn't work. We put this out in the plan of the day, et cetera, et cetera. And, and back aft, you could get a shower. And uh, his father was a farmer in Kansas. He told his father he couldn't get a shower on the ship. Next call I got was from the White House military office to me <laughs> specifically, Commander W.W. W. Cobb, you know, serial number, da, 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 da. <laughs> so I had to answer that. So, yeah, it is a problem. Um, okay, I'll just close with just building on what Rick says. Um, uh, this this maintenance backlog we have of 30-something billion dollars is, a, is not going to go away. It's just going to get bigger. Uh, but we have to remember... Uh, we in the material establishment and uh, logistics train, and we have to remember that our job is to fulfill our mission. And uh, But as we get on these nine and 10 month deployments where ships can hardly get into port of any kind, and that's why a lot of them look like they do in some cases, uh, where they're at sea for 90 days, 100 days, 150 days. Uh, I was on a ship, the Fox, we were under, underway uh, we had two days in port out of 152 days at sea. Uh, as, as we get into those kinds of things, that's a real problem. And we're going to have to fix this problem. I don't have all the answers. But again, we have to balance the workload, uh, the backlog, with the fleet uh, you know, requirement to do our mission. And we should all remember that. And uh, by the way, I just, uh, uh, now I don't have any big answers except except we need to sit down with everybody in the same room and figure out how we're gonna do this. Obviously, if we don't deploy as much, that makes, uh, makes it risky for some of the uh, combatant commanders, uh, clearly. Um, and, and can we assume that kind of risk? Well, uh, I don't know. I'm not, again, way above my pay grade, but I will say that 
the bottom line is we in the material establishment have to do everything we can to get these ships ready because the mission is the mission is what we're paid to do and that's what we're going to do uh last thing quote from admiral king world war ii i don't know what this logistics crap is but i want more of it um <laughs> that's that's a true statement however that having been this case again number one is mission uh, capability and, and uh, enabling the fleet commanders to do their job and do everything we can in the material establishment to uh to uh to do that and and uh, I great, greatly appreciate this opportunity. Uh, Admiral Baugh, I, I greatly appreciate working with you and your NAVC. Tim Oliver, good friend for many years, and his brother, Admiral Dave Oliver, two distinguished naval officers. <clears throat> Certainly Admiral Natter, his, his record and reputation speaks for itself. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. You, you know, it's interesting. Uh, thank you uh, uh, both uh, gentlemen. Uh, what's it so interesting is the energy around the comments of the audience, and we yeah. do this for the audience. And I and if we had more time, and of course, if you have more time and it goes longer, then people bail out, and you can't cover everything. But you know, there are so many things to celebrate. Uh, uh, in the uh, early days of the uh, Thresher class, uh, later to be known as the Permit class, they're they're producing and commissioning submarines every ninety days to answer the national call of the Cold War. And of course, the leadership of the class, uh, you know, six, seven months into its service uh, has, has a, a, very, um, a very serious casualty. And we celebrated that uh, in, in a different second Saturday. But the, the point was that Bill Cobb raised earlier was that Admiral Rickover brings in what I would call the metaphoric prose from Dover. And without uh, upsetting the production line, uh, they 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 find the root causes, and and then they create the subsafe program. Yep. And uh, one of the most brilliant uh, programs that the Navy, I think, can argue uh, ever instituted. You know, after the advent of a of a class, we we could have talked about that uh, shock mounting things of that nature. Right. Even back to, uh, or even back to the, um, I was going to say shock testing. I said mounting. I meant testing. But even back to World War II, Skip Lockwood sends the SSs that have been on six, seven patrols to Mare Island, crew rest, refresh, upgrade uh, fire control systems, new torpedoes, uh, training, and and just relax, get back into the game. And uh, what we were able to do with our battleships. Uh, Paul Stillwell's brilliant novel, Battleship Commander, about, um, about uh, uh, Cheng Li, uh, Willis Lee, and his, his great work in, uh, in running battle, battleships uh, throughout the war. There are so many things to celebrate, and yes, there are, are substantial challenges, but I hope um, we keep our eye on the, the ball of, that we've got a lot to be proud of. So I want to thank the audience uh, for their energetic uh, repartee. I want to thank our panelists. Uh, Captain Hepburn, your service in our Navy made a difference every day and the important jobs you held. Admiral Cobb, same over to you. Uh, we were blessed to have you both in uh, the jobs you had in your, during your service. But uh, I want to thank everyone, uh, foundation members, friends, for your participation today. If you liked our program, hit subscribe, like, and ring the bell to be notified of future content. Uh, just to let you know, we posted an hour-long discussion on YouTube this very week of our 40th commemoration of the Battle of the Falklands with Dr. Peter Haynes, Secretary John Lehman, Mr. Dove Zackheim, and Mr. Normal, Norman Polmar. It's one for the ages. We're doing a short on wow. Norman Polmar's eight points of uh, lessons learned from, uh, from that that will be posted this week. Next month is our annual meeting and we're pleased to announce the keynote David T. Layton speaker is Mr. Patrick K. O'Donnell, author of The Indispensables. You'll be able to attend the meeting at the National Museum of the United States Navy or join us live via YouTube. Please consider joining our foundation and many thanks to our panelists Dr. Simons, for your pre-recorded remarks, which were brilliant, and especially to our producer, Colin Masso, who also wrote the original music. Have a great day. And thank you for your participation today. Out thank here. you. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you, God.